This is the Pacific Ocean, a few hundred miles northeast of Australia. Members of the Bougainville Revolutionary Army cram their boats with much needed supplies of medicine and fuel and prepare to set off from the Solomon Islands for home. But first of all, there is a prayer for safe passage. Their prayers, I know, will be needed because home for these BRA guerrillas is the little known island of Bougainville where they're fighting an even lesser known war of independence with Papua New Guinea. For seven years, Papua New Guinea has blockaded the island. Its gunboats and helicopters patrol these waters with shoot to kill orders, which means we have a three hour gauntlet to run. I'm here because this is a war for which Britain is also responsible. It was the huge mine that a British company dug on Bougainville which provoked the fighting. And it was Britain's casual redrawing of the border a century ago that turned it into war. Breaking down on that border as we enter Papua New Guinea sea space seems about the worst place to do so. I scan the horizon for gunboats, knowing we're carrying so much fuel that just a stray bullet will be enough to fry us. The horizon, however, stays serene. This is a route that's cost many lives, yet it's Bougainville's only channel to the outside world. It is also the only way in to the longest and bloodiest conflict in the Pacific since World War II. Just as we near the island, the horizon loses its serenity. We breathe with relief when it turns out to be another BRA boat. But at least I've had a tiny taste of what the Bougainvillians go through every day. This is the story of an unsung people who took on Papua New Guinea, Australia, and the biggest mining company in the world, who started by fighting helicopter gunships with bows and arrows, and have lost a tenth of their population, and yet who managed to create what may be the world's first true eco-revolution. The next morning, we find ourselves in the hands of Bougainville Revolutionary Army Commander Ishmael Toroama. Our main goal is to get to President Francis Ona, the elusive man who started the revolution. But for the moment, Ishmael's capable hands will certainly do. I'm amazed to find him driving everywhere, as the fuel the BRA get into their boats can't go far. But that's a trick I won't find out till later. Ishmael was a mechanic before the war. Now people call him the Bougainville Ninja. Makes my arms feel good. So I could handle the M60. Miss I used to plug on. So now so Narla Ham Lumi time me cut this like in in serium stop low right left hand yeah. Then up hold him to must gun. That's all. Uh Emmy also one year old now, since me kiss him this like incident. He plus the nablo beats front. 
le mieux que le sauté mon magnète na oli tromem tripla m2 3 grenic oli lonchi mica mon plein missimi number 2 missimi number 3 missimi number number 4 one em kam pas lo han blomi hanya oli nak chopim emi no got use emi be useless that's all just because if i believe lo one em something if lo lo fight long em emi help emi pla we're the first people ever to film Ishmael and his men, yet I don't get the feeling he really trusts us. His way of getting closer is a kind of baptism of fire, if gentler than those he gives both Papua New Guinea's soldiers and the men he's training on this patrol. My sound man and I think might be a smoke bomb turns out to be tear gas. It's Ishmael's way of saying welcome, a short, sharp dose of Bougainvillian reality. After a good cough, cry and laugh together, he loosens up and radios for us to meet Francis' owner. Yeah, Roger, I make him good. Lolo, that work. So, uh, Francis' uh, initiative in starting the war, and I just got up uh, behind it. Every part of the island has got minerals in it, and Francis saw that uh, these things would bring change and as uh, change about to spoil the environment and the future generation. But before we leave, Ishmael gets second thoughts about us seeing Francis. A makeshift generator has blown up one of our camera batteries while it was charging. Uh, last night when I slept, uh, God told me that the, tomorrow there will be something happen. And, and all of a sudden the battery blew up. I made up my mind to tell you that uh, you will not go to Francis on Otherwise, you face some problems there because your battery blew up. It's another glimpse of the strange grip that God and superstition hold over Bougainville. Since the boat trip in, I'm no longer inclined to laugh at superstition, but I explain that if TV crews read all the things that go wrong as bad omens, then the medium would cease to exist. Reluctantly, Ishmael concedes to our heathen ignorance. He gives us the two days of torturous uphill clambering that will take us to Francis' owner and the heart of the war. When I'm not gasping for air, I get an idea of why the Bougainvillians have such fierce reverence for the place they call Mekamui, or Sacred Island, and why they could no longer sit by and watch its minerals being plundered. We have seen our valleys, we have seen our forests, we have seen our rivers, beautiful rivers, beautiful trees, beautiful forests literally you know, thrown into dust, and we will not allow that to happen. En route to Francis, we come across his vice president, Joseph Kabui, who puts the history of the place into perspective for us. Ever since the French explorer, Louis de Bougainville, put his name on the map in 1768, the island has gone through an endless game of colonial past the parcel. Geographically, ethnically, and culturally, it was always part of the Solomon Islands, but a hundred years ago, the imperial powers decided to change all that. The situation that we are in is not only a unique for Bougainville. I mean, there are many African countries that the superpowers, you know, merely just carve them out, you know, put a line right through and say, OK, this part belongs to you, this part belongs to me. A deal was struck between Germany and Britain. Germany saying, OK, I'll give Western Samoa to you, Britain, and Britain said, OK, I'll give Bougainville to you. Germany didn't keep Bougainville long, though, as Australia grabbed it during the First World War. During the Second, Japan snatched the island for a few years before Australia grabbed it back. And in the meantime, it had ended up as part of Papua New Guinea, which got independence in 1975. Bougainville declared independence two weeks earlier, not that anyone listened, and it took another 13 years for war to break out. <coughs> At last we find the man who can really explain why things suddenly changed. 
Francis Ona is portrayed by many as a humorless, hardline revolutionary. I suspect they never really met him, because it certainly isn't the impression I get. <laughs> So this is Papua New Guinea's public enemy number one. When he's not running either the war or the self-declared Republic of Bougainville, Francis goes gardening. My painting on Bougainville, based on these factors, one, that is, we are fighting for man and his culture, and two, land and environment, and the third one is independent. Francis used to work for a mining company called Bougainville Copper Limited. It was a company he would later destroy. The reason, as it's always been on Bougainville, was the land and the bounty it holds. This, this is a Panguna mine. <coughs> um, it's a uh, it's, uh, development that has been taken, you know, uh, place starting back in 1960s. My people here were very ignorant and they didn't know that in the future uh, there would be a very big mine here, which is very destructive. Before reaching the final layers of overburden, they cleared 550 acres of jungle and sluiced away the unconsolidated volcanic rock and ash. Bougainville Copper Limited, or BCL, is mainly owned by an Australian subsidiary of the world's mining giant, Britain's Rio Tinto Zinc. In 1967, the company was given the go-ahead to excavate what was then the world's biggest open-cast copper mine, 500 metres deep and covering about seven square kilometres or the size of London's West End, where Rio Tinto's headquarters are based. It turned out to be a disastrous mistake, especially as they dug the hole right beneath Francis's village. In Bougainville, you don't come between the people and their land. We Bougainvilleans, we rely on our land. Land is our lifeline, land is our mother, and it's our protection. This place was a very big jungle, with, uh, uh, which is a hunting ground for the people of this area. Uh, we had big trees, you know. Also, there was a very big hill here. Right in the middle here, there was a very big hill. Much higher than uh, the top of those mountains up there. And now it's all disappeared. So now this, this land, which belongs to people, my people, is now become a barren land. And um, I don't know. Are we going to use this land back again? <laughs> when the locals protested about the huge hole the multinational wanted to dig at the fertile heart of their island, their land was taken by force. Of the three billion US dollars the mine made in profit, only a thousandth was given back to the people who owned the land. Rio Tinto Zinc had started to create their most expensive enemy. In the meantime, the inhabitants were shunted off into makeshift resettlements on desolate ground. That's the that's the Dapeda village, and you can see that's the standard of building they they built here for people. It's um, you know really like a sandy town. This hill was you know not uh, been too much you know genuine to how we can resettle the people. This, this school was built by, uh, by people themselves. Uh, even the company and, and the government, they, they, they did not give any support. Just imagine, right in the middle of the giant copper mine, multi, multi-million, you know, world. And here we are, people building their own uh, schools, you know, out of their own pockets. But the thing that really stuck in the craw of the Bougainvillians was the pollution spilling over their land. Waste from the mine to the tune of about a billion tonnes ended up flowing down the Jaba River, 
contaminating it with copper, mercury, lead and arsenic. It killed off the wildlife and turned whole forests into moonscape. The land still bears the garish scars. This is where all the pollution has been uh, drained from, uh, from the Panguna mine. You cannot uh, drink water now down there. There are no fish, virtually nothing. And this will be maybe uh, for the next uh, 200 years. This whole river system has been uh, destroyed and even you can swim into this uh, river. Things hit boiling point in late 1988 when the Young Landowners Association, led by Francis, demanded both the closure of the mine and $10 billion in damages. The story goes that the BCL management laughed at them, 10 billion being far more than the mine was worth. Francis did not like being laughed at. He left the meeting in a hurry, broke into the local mining depot and stole 50 kilos of high explosives. He and his friends had decided to close down the mine themselves with some well-targeted sabotage. Panicked about losing what was nearly half of its export earnings, Papua New Guinea sent in the riot police. They burnt down homes, beat people up, killed a few, and generally created enough backlash to provide Francis's fledgling guerrilla force with all the recruits it needed. Ragtag bunch though the Bougainville Revolutionary Army were, their very name showed they were now raising the stakes. They didn't just want the mine closed down, they wanted independence too. It was all getting a bit much for the riot squad. So in came the army, the Papua New Guinea Defence Force. Rio Tinto Zinc abandoned the mine, and a David and Goliath war was on, with BRA stones and slings versus PNG helicopters. It was then that Francis realised they weren't fighting just Papua New Guinea, but Australia as well. Australia's ex-colonial interests meant it was already training and arming the PNG DF. Now it also suspended a Foreign Crimes Act allowing its pilots to fly the helicopters it suddenly supplied. Helicopters that were quickly turned into gunships and trained mainly on an unarmed population. Faced with such brutal and powerful weaponry, the Bougainvillians were forced into the first of a long list of innovations. This is the first uh, <coughs> homemade equipment that uh, we made uh, to start the fight, start the war. Um, we got a sling here. And uh, you get this uh, sling hooked on here, put a harrow in there, that goes in through that pipe, you know. And when you prick at this, this up, it goes up and uh, arrow applies. Uh, we make our own guns using all the material um, uh, all around the place, uh, been left by uh, also in the Panguna picked them up and then used to build, uh, cut down all the machines, cut down all the pieces and turn them together. Like this one, all this has been made here and we doubled them, uh, made in Mekamui and it's got a serial number. So if part of the equipment is uh, been uh, destroyed in the field, they can come back and then build their own guns. And this is how we uh, build uh, confidence in the force. So just imagine, with one, one cylinder weapon winning a SRL, and from that single SRL, we went on to uh, winning uh, now battery about two to 300 uh, uh, very powerful weapons. This one is uh, resting now, having a holiday or whatever. <laughs> Rest him for good, yeah. I saw that uh, PNGDF, they came just to kill the villagers and the civilians. I went out to Panguna and I saw Francis ask him where are the weapons and he told me this. There is no weapon. We, we will only start with bows and arrows and stones and sticks. I did the training myself. Uh, the tactics, the tricks, they're mine. And we made and put everything into action and we uh, captured two high-powered rifles. The boys saw how I fought and they thought that uh, I was a good leader. So they started following me. So that's how I ended up in holding the position of the BRA.
there are no clear front lines in the jungle. Even though they've made it their own, Ishmael and his boys know the PNGDF may never be far away. That's the place where I usually train my boys and uh, I usually use live bullets and sometimes uh, wounded some of the boys, soldiers, so that's how they got the experience. How many have you wounded? Uh, 12 of them. <laughs> yeah. Very badly? Uh, yeah. One was very badly injured, and the other uh, uh, 11 of them were just a scratch. Around 15,000 Bougainvilleans have been killed during the war, out of a population only 10 times that. Yet most haven't been slaughtered by Papua New Guinea Defence Force munitions, like these ones mortared during a church service. The majority have died from the lack of essential supplies created by Papua New Guinea and Australia's most insidious weapon, the seven-year siege of the island. By early 1990, the PNGDF was losing control of most of Bougainville, so it decided to establish a sea blockade around the island, which it hoped would turn the population against the Bougainville Revolutionary Army. As a quick glance at history could have predicted, quite the opposite happened. With bodies piling up from the lack of food, shelter and medicine, the BRA and the people rose against the challenge of the blockade together. Forced to learn the hard way that necessity is the mother of invention, their solutions came from the land. With the blockade being imposed by the uh, Papua New Guinea government, uh, we found that um, uh, every family must be self-sufficient for the food staff. That's why we have to make our own gardens. Um, we got a um, sifting cult cultivation type of uh, gardening here, and we have uh, integrated uh, mainly every crop, every uh, food crop that we can find. William was a businessman, now a refugee from PNG held territory. He shows us the green fingers he's had to develop. This whole area is full of gardens. How the people here survive because the soil is so rich. It doesn't matter if you're going to do the garden farming on one area, single area, we're still going to get fruit. The fruit is still going to go on, garden. What garden we got is we got sweet potato, we got bananas, we got cassava, and we got a lot of taros um, uh, we planted. Sugar cane, and then we got purples. We got a uh, lot of yams around here. Uh, onion, what onion, corns and tomatoes, peanut, potatoes. People, it's very hard for them to hungry. People in Bougainville alone, they survive. That's why we say we can't depend on other people. We got a blessing. Gardens from here is no end. And you got bush from the river up to another mountain. As you see, all the whole green is all over. That's Bougainville. Yet no plant on Bougainville comes close to the importance of the coconut. We know we've been fed and sheltered by it, but then Ishmael shows us what a perfectly packaged life support system it is, and how his people have learned to make use of every part of it. What a block of coconut. Now we got a lot of iron, but it's strong now. Skin long on, squeeze him, uh, put him low fire. The time you hot, you better squeeze him. Now, suppose you got sore, you not put him low sore. You tap long on, skin long on, dry skin long on, tap him low fire, low cook, 
the cell block and this lah. Suppose you got plant the mosquito because since lor, uh, I don't know I got mosquito because I use this lah the mosquito. Milk block and lo hap. Uh, cook your clone milk him. Mm, coconut milk by like cook him kumu. Coconut oil, lo lamb. Now this lah like, I mean new plaka in something where me play in line in cell of crisis. Then plus I use him. Coconut leaf lo basket. Me plus I use him long basket. Me play got soap made of coconut oil and first grade oil. He got triple grade A, B, and C. Na lo grade and me plus I walk him na just a clean him all gun. In the war for the environment, it helps to have the environment on your side. Uh, it's for if you had a nose block, then you can we usually use it for uh, clearing the nose so that you can smell anything on the road. Uh, just like enemies come, you can just smell them. When uh, we found that we didn't have very effective uh, equipment, we developed our own booby traps. And that is uh, made from herbs where we laid on the truck where the enemy is uh, moving. And then when they go bite, you know, they start to develop a sickness. In one of the booby traps, your testicles, you know, just swollen up and your penis, you know, just enlarge. But it's for healing rather than hurting that the Bougainvilleans have developed the bush medicine of their ancestors. With the PNGDF driving much of the population into the jungle, thousands were dying in unsanitized childbirth and from preventable diseases like malaria, pneumonia and dysentery. Tetanus from a badly handled machete, for instance, could prove lethal before the islanders once again made the land their ally. That uh, piece of as asbestos. Is it from the mine? Yes, yeah. from the Pongo Pylon. Um, we got uh, all these herbs put into the uh, just uh, all of five of the uh, popo, and then with uh, steam blown into that uh, that area where it will going to dry up very soon. Francis is always on call as local GP and his presidential HQ doubles as a surgery. We got herbs here, set in medicine, um, which um, um, locates the areas being damaged, you know, and um, blood is not uh, flowing well. If there is no sickness, it will just, you know, slice through like this. But when uh, it finds areas where it is not functioning well, it will stick, you know. It sticks mm. like a clue, you know. The claims of Francis and his fellow healers amaze me. Being able to cure malaria, leprosy, appendicitis and cancer without operating, developing a herbal contraceptive which doesn't harm women. Having seen what else these people can do, I can no longer just dismiss it, especially as so many patients back it up. And at least Francis isn't so sure about all the cures. We have... Uh given a treatment to some person because he had a AIDS, AIDS disease and sent him uh, home. But we didn't have uh, proof, you know, any medical reports by doctors. So that's why we think we have uh, treated someone with AIDS. So Francis invites anyone with AIDS to come to test the Bougainvillean cure. Let's go gardening now.
Besides what they get from the land, the islanders have found uses for absolutely anything that Bougainville Copper Limited and its employees left behind. Though in a place where the infrastructure's gone to pot, things constantly require improvised repairs. It's my car over there. Uh, it's not actually mine, but when I fought, everything just got into hands. The PNGDF, they came, they, they shot at me, and just, just some of the bullet holes. I don't know how it happened, but I was in the, I was in the hands of the Lord, so I was saved. Along with his truck, his generator, his exercise gym, Ishmael brings anything else he can carry back from successful operations. On a blockaded island, it's the only way to go shopping. Well, that's it, so. He likes playing with the ball. I, I took the ball from one operation in Boca. That's uh, part of the victory. I, I had to go and give it to my kids. Well, that's where we play. It's the, the music shop, the music station. We teach ourselves how to play. Oh, this is the place. It's really not good, but we like it being here. I like it being here. It just uh, reminds me of the simple life. My hand is not really good, but this is the rhythm. And the lead is over there, and that's the keyboard over there. Jesus, we praise your name, because you are the soon coming king. The scavenger's mecca on Bougainville is the Panguna mine itself and the town built to house its workers. After devastating it to make sure the miners never returned, Francis and his fellow villagers ended up having to go back to salvage anything not rooted in concrete. Because along with getting the Bougainvillians to start from scratch with food and medicine, the PNGDF also burnt down many of their houses and gave them that problem to solve. We have to uh, make our own locks. So what we do is we go down to Pankuna and get uh, all the locks and uh, uh, strip them out and uh, uh, make our own uh, keys using all the rubbish from the Pankuna mine. We can build uh, good houses. As you can see, uh, bits and uh, pieces of light lighting up uh, houses. Uh, Switch boxes. I know these people can make something out of nothing, but I still can't work out how they can light whole villages. William laughs and takes us to his local workshop. As you see, all, all the parts and all the machines, like a water pump, it's a barbed wire. We've got something to do with it, because some people, they might throw it away. We don't. We collect parts. We can make things out of it. The islanders have dragged the mine's debris, sometimes for weeks across the mountains, to create this sort of setup. And it's in places like this that they've cobbled together their own ecological power supply, hydroelectricity. Okay, these are the intake uh, pipes for the hydro, and from there it goes right down to the uh, generator itself. After uh, Papua New Guinea government has blockaded us, and then um, you know we couldn't have any um, petrol or diesel, we have to develop something to get um, power supply. And we, yeah, we got uh, this mini hydro um, using all the um, rubbish or the pipes and um, spare parts from uh, all cars. We managed to develop our own um, hydro, which. Um, we can use for lighting up all the villages. We got about um, 50 to 60 and now running this type of uh, small hydros. Down, down there where the PNCDF establishment, there is virtually uh, not much uh, lighting up, no electricity. Um, maybe it's sort of um, uh, money or something for, you know, to run those um, generators. 
But here in the bush, we can have uh, hydro going for 24 hours a day. I think with the blockade still on, that would be very nice. Because then we'll be learning more and more and advance into the uh, near future so that uh, new things will come, new uh, ideas grow. New ideas have been growing wherever I look, but the high point of this eco-revolution has to be the way they're still driving around without any proper fuel supply after seven years of blockade. The secret, as I should have guessed, is growing all around me. Francis once stated that the war against Papua New Guinea could be won in a week. The war against Australia, that would take a little bit longer. And by 1996, the Bougainville Revolutionary Army was winning. PNG's last big offensive turned into its biggest rout. And when we get to the island, the BRA hold about 80% of the territory. You can see that that's the uh, Toyo Valley. Further down, where you can see the last mountain, that's where at last um, the PNCDF camp is, that's Bolabe. And uh, that's where they end. They don't come any further. The PNGDF don't come any further, not just because they're beaten, but also because they hardly care anymore. In the war for hearts and minds, the BRA were always winning. And when no other country came to Bougainville's aid, the people found support in a different realm, because the colonial legacy they most embraced was that of the missionaries. I think without Jesus, I wouldn't have come this far. Just because without that superpowers, the Australian government or whoever who has been uh, helping the Papua New Guinea government might have um, beaten me a long time ago. What were through? Oh, can can maybe you can put on this place? What were through? You plan on cross by the can can get out now or something? Eh? Then bingo the temptation now take or take or go out of Blow on them. You plan on failing on committing me one time, Jesus. You now by you put on all kind of temptation. Okay, but I'm thinking Papa God, and there's a lot of operation where people have been walking about long in, where you know that one man even seem to be long in, you know that one man he lose him life long in. My uncle, he sees things. Uh, he normally comes uh, with us, and where we are in the enemy territory, uh, he can feel, he can see. Uh, he sees vision from God that the enemies are going to attack, or if they're in the ambush, we can change our plans and and operation for the same minute when there's a vision from God. Father, me pray, now thank you, me. Oh, get something where me have been walking, you watch him big name long and Thank you, Lord, Father. Me play no losing one for life, long one for brother, but me play no losing operation. Oh, same now, me play, thank you, me, oh, Father God. You watch him big name, you were blessing me, play one one. Now, I'm black and try and best for me, black and long go on, not black operation. Amen. Okay. Go to the house, clean him all gun, go to the next use. Once we've broken enough bread and sweat together, Ishmael trusts us enough to reveal the secret charms he uses in combat. We use it for uh, poisoning the gun. And we usually put it on the tip of the gun so that when, when we shoot an enemy, Automatically, when the bullet go inside, there are snakes, small snakes that usually come out of the man's body. So it's just like, uh, uh, just like we are poisoning them. But God's power is unlimited. It's just like when you charge a battery into a, 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 a you put into a charging device, then it charges more power. Then <clears throat> that is what I've learned, and I uh, give up hope in us using this. Now that Ishmael sees our camera batteries in a more positive way, he lets us in further. I'm not proud to be a fighter. I'm proud because 
my name is written in the book of life. Yeah, and uh, I'm saved, and th- and that is what I'm proud of. It's just like a miracle that God helped me while I was injured here. When I lay down, the Lord spoke to me and said, "You're only half an inch away from death." So uh, I said, "Yes, uh, I'll choose you, and I'm going to follow you." That's why I really want to be some kind of a man who's preaching the gospel. It's just a miracle that God has saved Bougainville. The islander's devotion seemed to pay off in early 1997 when God moved in one of his most mysterious ways. Papua New Guinea basically admitted defeat by hiring mercenaries to do what the PNGDF couldn't. It forked out $36 million to the London-based company Sandline International and presented the BRA with the biggest armed threat it had ever faced. And then, lo and behold, the PNGDF itself came to Bougainville's aid. Humiliated by the very idea of needing foreign troops, and even more angry at the price, the underfunded PNG soldiers rallied huge popular support, arrested the mercenaries, and threw them out. Suppose only win come na only use him all rocket number out, I think boy only not win. That's all. This la equipment only got. A man and me walk him. This la God lo bogan mil em sa toki mi pla all sem. So mi pla even believe by mi pla win him all modern weapons long all. Because all the time he by no got way or sem. Suppose you go you pass lo brick wall by stop, and me must cut way out. Finding a way out is something the Bougainvilleans tend to do with startling regularity. And none amazes me more than the way they fuel the transport so crucial to fighting a war. With hundreds of abandoned mine vehicles littering the island, how were the BRA going to run them without diesel? Finally, William shows us. This is the complete thing of uh, scraping the coconut from scraping to squeeze to ferment and then the last thing to cook the oil, the one litre oil, maybe about 15 dry coconut for uh, a litre. That's the first grade this way. It's beautiful. Not only is coconut oil far less polluting than diesel, you also get double the mileage. Ishmael laughs that after the war, they're really going to scare Esso and Shell. Coconut is by come up on nervous states, low island lumipa. Suppose coconut in Nogat, some la have low revolution minating by me play in a come up with these states. And everyone here is convinced that what they've achieved despite having everything against them proves beyond doubt that they can run their own state, especially with all the ecological innovations they're sworn to developing further when they become independent. With the closure of the mine, we have been blessed. We have been blessed. We have been blessed to see, you know, abundance of food. Uh, We have been blessed with, you know, breathing fresh air. If we win this, certainly it's going to become quite an important president. In fact, Bougainville has already become a precedent, inspiring many other Pacific communities having holes dug in their backyards. Across the region, resistance to and compensation from ecological devastation has upped considerably. And when, thanks to the mercenary debacle, the news broke of this obscure bunch of islanders beating Papua New Guinea and Australia and Rio Tinto Zinc, suddenly the international community got interested in beginning peace talks in mid-1997. Wow. 
What? What? Francis, who has fears of winning the war but losing the peace, steers clear of the compromises involved in the proposed deal. He is labelled a hardliner for this, but maybe that's because he's not the kind of leader we're used to and knows how easily Bougainville could lose its way in the jungle of international politics. During my uh, high school days, I was appointed to uh, sweep um, the principal's house. But on one occasion, I found him, you know, was doing my job, was cleaning up the toilet. And I asked him, why could you, the principal, could do such a thing? And what he um, told me was that the leaders must come down and clean the dead for his people. And that, that taught me a very, very big lesson which I'm looking forward to teach other leaders in all parts of the world that the leader must clean the boots for his people. The peace process, though, is creating a rift between Francis and one of the prime movers behind it, his vice president, Joseph Kabui. This is it. We will either make it or break it. And because it is now, as I see it, it is now a game of survival, of political survival. And there is a clear cut political tension right now. Change is imminent from the way things are now looking. What do you mean by change then? Change of political leadership, that is. A president will be changed. Could be changed uh, sometime soon. And who would be the new president? <laughs> well, it's up to, up to people to decide and have to be ready to decide. So um, you know, we will wait and see how things will go about. But it will probably be you, will it? Well, if it comes to me, um, I'm ready and willing. Joseph also has Ishmael's support. But despite their different methods, they and Francis definitely have the same end in mind. Independence with a capital I. Without independence, we are looking at more bloodshed. We are looking at more uh, destruction of Bougainville through the means of, you know, the Papua New Guinea government and Australian government because they got a mining interest. They will bring back all the multinational companies that destruct all the land. And it's that freedom. It's that peace. It's the mine I'm not up, up because M by giving problem to all future generations of people of Bougainville. Now, people are not like this like by come up. No go to lime lo mipla lo bia in time all by looking na all by talk all same. All four fathers lo mipla all in open, making mipla by mipla sin down all same. All in bagarapi mipla trauma mipla that's why mipla end up all same. Men on this earth, on planet earth, defend on land, defend on environment, and I wish to uh, ask everyone, every leader of any nation, to uh, take care and um, take care of the land so that uh, people on this planet Earth can be saved. The future, rather than tales of past woes, is what all the Bougainvilleans I've met focus upon. Despite the destruction of their land, eight years of isolation, untold atrocities, and up to 15,000 deaths, the impression I take home is of a people who don't seem to know the meaning of self-pity, let alone pessimism. Before we leave to run the blockade on our way out, Francis sends us off with one of the songs he writes for his regular communal sing-sings. Since we left Bougainville, the peace talks have led to a permanent ceasefire. The blockade has been lifted and reconciliation and restoration are taking place. Yet Papua New Guinea is still dodging the central demand of the BRA, a referendum on independence. Things aren't over yet. But whatever happens, when it comes to self-help and ecology, 
the Bougainvilleans have already given the world many lessons it can learn, if it ever chooses to. So I used to thank uh, Papua New Guinea government for imposing a uh, blockade, because if blockade was, wasn't imposed on Bougainville, we wouldn't develop this path. Nobody has been trained, but so natural talent that we are developing. I think with the blockade, the Bokanville War is like an educational center, or furthermore, I could say it's a university for all of us who are on Bokanville. Now you make a step on the mushroom, and the plum broken.